I've been, I've been to the North Pole, I've been to the White House. I wrote this stuff about the muzzling of uh, Jim Hansen uh, for the Times. I've um, been to the Amazon, writing about every freaking aspect of this story for so long that it's become so normalized, it's, that's strange to me, that for me it's not scary. It's just part of the, the human journey right now. <laughs> well, um, uh, for, it depends on who you are. For some people, for some people, march. <laughs> and for Jim Hansen, you know, tie yourself to the White House fence. For me, uh, communicate and teach people how to communicate. The, at Pace University, I teach a blogging course called Blogging a Better Planet. I teach a documentary course where we focus on sustainable uh, resource management <laughs> issues, make films. Um, I teach an environmental policy course uh, and communication. So for me, it's teach. Uh, for other people, it's uh, my wife is an environmental educator. Uh, you can start to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. There's a role. One thing about a wicked issue like global warming, you know, the, the bad news is it's so complicated. It's really hard. The good news is it's so complicated. There's something for everybody to do. And uh, one thing I think is really important going forward. I mean, there's a lot of things that are happening that are the, the trajectories for uses of these fuels, um, especially because a big chunk of the world hasn't really electrified yet, they, you know, or gotten mobilized like we are. Uh, we're on, uh, we're going to be using more fossil fuels before we use less. That's like, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing Jim Hansen can do that's going to change that fundamental trajectory for the time being. Um, they're still cheap and available and and nothing else, uh, everything else is starting from such a low base, it's going to take time. Jim Hansen was here yesterday talking about nuclear power. Uh, if you cross out nuclear power, then that leaves a big hole in the energy menu that it has to, makes it that much harder to fill with other things that are not polluting. So um, I think he said, what, you, what did he say? He said, I'm gonna tell you some things you're not gonna, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's his analysis. There are other people who are very smart. Amory Lovins at Rocky, Rocky Mountain Institute will talk to you for five, he could sit in this chair for five hours and tell you why we can have a rapid transition to a clean energy world. And so um, my task is to navigate among all those arguments. Um, and, and I think the main thing is paralysis is not, sustainable. <laughs> so you, whether you're uh, indifferent or uh, just feel it's too big, that, that's, that's really not a tenable position given where we know trajectories for these, for, for environmental change are going. And, and by the way, the other factor that's happening right now is we're having this amazing human pulse of development. We're going, you know, we're heading toward uh, 9 billion of us for, from 7. When I was uh, 12 years old, there were 2 point, well, when I was born in 1956, I show this graph the year I was born, there were 2.7 billion people on the planet, and now there's seven going toward nine. And, and again, that's just numbers of people, that's not stuff, you know, how much stuff we use. Uh, so it's kind of, how many people, how much stuff determines our environmental impacts and climate impacts. So um, get engaged. And, and the other thing I've been calling for is, <coughs> um, weirdly, we need to have a sense, of, I think you need to have urgency and patience at the same time. <laughs> It seems like you can't even use those two words in the same sentence, but I think it's really vital because none of this is a quick fix. There was a fiction from like an inconvenience truth right through 2009. <coughs> there was this sort of fantasy that this was a one president kind of thing, that in 2009 the climate treaty would suddenly magically appear and uh, that was always not, anyone you know dug in on this knew that was not the case. So. Patience is just as important as urgency. Yeah. Why does the pro-environmental movement not have a perfect analogy to the Koch brothers? How come we don't have a pair of <laughs> billionaires spewing the same amount of, you know, There are actually, uh, there, there, there have been some analyses. I mean, there has been, there have been hundreds of millions of dollars that were spent in the run-up to the climate bill in 2009 by environmental groups. Hundreds of millions by foundations um, on a lot of stuff. Um, Right now, they finance um, several different websites that p push, uh, you know, information about climate change. Um, Tom Steyer, this billionaire, is bankrolling all kinds of initiatives now, including direct political action of, on, against politicians who poo-poo global warming. Um, the, but here's the here's the issue, and I've written about this. I wish I could show you this slide, this this image, a cartoon a, a woman created for me. Um, if, if our fossil fuel norms are a big boulder sitting in the middle of a, on a hill, <clears throat> a path on a hill, and 
the job of environmentalists is to move that boulder. It's a, you know, it's a big task to decarbonize a carbon, an 80% carbon economy. Um, and then if you're in the Koch position or if you, you're, if you have some interest in keeping us happy with our fossil fuels, you could be standing there with a feather duster just kind of dusting the boulder and sprinkling just a tiny, like a little bit of fairy dust uh, uncertainty. But the boulder is hard to move, so it's like it's never been an even battle anyway. It's not like if the left had suddenly had billions of dollars to spend on um, clear information or uh, action campaigning, it would magically move that boulder. Because the reality is we're, and there's a lot of inertia in the system. We really like fossil fuels. It's really hard to uninvent suburbia. I don't, you know, I, I, I live up the, the Hudson. I, mad, I moved into a village right on the train line. Now I can, I can walk to the train, come in. But you know, most, of, most of America and a big chunk of the world is already built out in a very fossil dependent way. So, so, so they, it's the advantage of maintaining stasis is really easy. So it doesn't even take hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Um, transforming the plant, the, the world's energy systems is epically hard. And uh, even with a lot more resources, it wouldn't, not, wouldn't necessarily happen immediately. That's why I said urgency and patience. I mean, whether that also means get used to climate change. It's, a, it's all about limiting climate change. No, no one's solving the climate problem. It's just not, that's not how it works, at least to my mind. It, sorry. So, By the way, a, a quick round of applause for the cast. I don't know who is, who's left here. But I, I, I was, uh, uh, and, and of course the uh, auteur. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's very it's a very courageous thing to, to to do a play like this. It's not you know, it, it topical plays I think are more challenging than than other stuff. Um, it's more it's much easier to get people engaged on issues where you don't have to learn anything at the same time. Uh, it's like um, it's like in a science article. You know, when I'm write, if you're writing an article about Derek Jeter, you don't have to explain baseball is a game with nine innings. <laughs> you, you, you know, the basics are already in everybody's heads. Even if you're not watching baseball, you kind of get the basics. But but for a play on greenhouse gases or whatever, you still have to sort of inject information in there, and that's that's hard. And it's hard to convey uh, as an actor too. So really, really good work. <laughs> here, here. I'm sorry, and you had a question. Um, so how different do our lives look in general if we convert to sustainable energy? Do we lose like our our luxuries, our conveniences, and is that different vision of that life may be a barrier towards converting to it? Well, I do think it's important to try to vision, envision futures. In other words, um, I think we would be better off in, in trying to, to literally to visualize, to envision the kinds of communi community, communities and technologies we would have in a world if we get, once we get through this peak us, you know, once we get through this surge that's happening right now. Um, what that would look like is kind of as variegated as humanity. The Bill McKibben wants it all to be small and local, but but he also needs to fly like I do to different campuses to speak and and you know to organize. So you, so flying is still part of it. Um, mo mobility is part of it. I think we're going to have connected technology for information more and more, just because the miniaturization of all that stuff is, you know, that's that. We're not going to all. We're not going to live local and isolated. I, I think there, but you know, everyone, everyone, if everyone develops a vision and has an open discussion about the future, then you have at least a, a sense of where you're going. A lot of what's been um, the rhetoric on around global warming has been kind of "woe is me, shame on you" stuff. That's not positive, and you need to. Shame. I mean, I've done my investigative reporting. You know. Uh, you need to point fingers sometimes, but, but I think we need to get busier painting that picture. And even within our own communities, finding ways to create the picture.